What's going on guys? So I have something a little bit interesting to talk about today. We're actually going to go over the history of Pokemon and Satoshi, its founder, creator, uh, as well as mention a lot of other people that helped make this whole thing happen. Ken Sugimori, uh, Arita, obviously. Um, so let's get into this. Um, yeah, Mr. Hero Arita, I'm sure people would love to know his history, um, and I'm probably going to save that for another video, but this is kind of the general history of Pokemon, the trading card game, the franchise, kind of all of it since its inception. So, I wrote down a bunch of notes here. I got a bunch of notes that I wrote down, um, and we're going to get into it. Okay. Now, as a disclaimer, you may hear some noise in the background. My wife runs a animal rescue, so there's usually dogs in the background barking, and we do have a one-year-old, so you may you may hear something in the background. But uh, let's go ahead and get into the beautiful history. So, so Pokemon is actually short for Pocket Monsters, which makes sense. I know a lot of you probably know that, but that's something that I honestly did not know. Um, and to supplement that, even though this is going to be a long video already, I'm going to go ahead and get this. Now this, I, I believe, is not anything original. It could be the Japanese version, but I believe it's in Chinese or something. I, it's definitely, I think, a, a counterfeit, uh, but I think it's really, really cool. Um, it does have the uh, pocket monsters in the bottom here. I'm going to zoom that in got the pocket monsters in the bottom there yes i know and this uh receipt machine right here would actually print out all the information when you actually caught all 100 <clears throat> all 151 pokemon and so this is kind of a counterfeit of yellow version uh but we'll get into all that uh here shortly so pokemon is short for pocket monsters uh, the franchise roots from a gaming magazine let's go ahead and refocus that the franchise roots from a gaming magazine that started in 1980s in Japan, um, in the early 1980s in Japan, um, called Game Freak. Now, I remember Game Freak. When I started reading this stuff, it registered immediately. Whenever you play any of the old games, for me, it was Fire Red, Leaf Green, kind of the re-retros of Red and Green, which I did not know that at the time. I know that now, and that's awesome to know this whole history. You know, we do all this collecting and then to not know the history behind it is kind of, um, it's just, it, it's, it's shocking because, you know, you would have, you would have thought within the last couple of years, I would know the full history of Pokemon given all the stuff that I've collected. So I really want to take time this week and next week to kind of learn more about what makes Pokemon so great. The energy, the artists, the illustrators, the designers, all the stuff that goes into making this such an awesome collectible and hobby. Um, so in the early 1980s, uh, in Japan, Game Freak was a magazine, a gaming magazine, which was started by Satoshi, which I will go into depth talking about Satoshi and how all of this kind of came to be. Uh, Satoshi Tajiri and Ken Sugimori. Um, Satoshi, so now I'm going to go into Satoshi a little bit. So Satoshi was known for playing in the fields of Tokyo, as well as kind of exploring any forested area, wooded area, and he would kind of collect bugs and insects. Now, before I read my notes, this is just stuff that I know that I've known before I did this research, just seeing random tidbits here and there, but uh, I'm going to get into it. Um, Satoshi loved bugs and the colors and the varieties, which would make a lot of sense considering the vast amount of different colors, you know, this Charmander, Pikachu, and this is a German Squirtle, but just the vibrant colors of all these cards and these different Pokemon and kind of what they represent. Um, that comes from the natural environment, so that's pretty cool. Um, Satoshi loved bugs and the colors and the variety, and he wanted to catch them all, which is where, where I think that that whole phrase came from, uh, trying to catch all the Pokemon. Um, now, this was his favorite hobby. I can't read my chicken scratch. Um, this was his favorite hobby and arguably what inspired him to create Pokemon and the Game Boy games uh, coming down the line. Um, he was given the nickname Dr. Bug, which I think is kind of interesting considering all the bug catcher type of trainers that you run into while you're playing the old Game Boy games. You know, you run into these 
bug catcher trainers, bug players, you know, their whole team would be bugs. And you'd wonder, why is there always an emphasis on, you know, running through the grass, running through the fields, and then the Pokemon pop up there? Well, it's because uh, Satoshi, as a kid, did that a lot as a kid. And that this these Pokemon games were really an extension of his personality as a young kid and the creativity and the imagination that he had at that time. And that's really important because my parents are artists and I understand that as you get older, you know, you lose a sense of adventure and imagination. And I think Pokemon brings that all out and brings all of that out in all of us. Um, he was, uh, they called him Dr. Bug because he was always searching for new bugs, types of insects to add and further his collection. Now, I've always thought this is, uh, this resonates really really greatly with me because I, when I was a kid, I went after insects and I went after lizards and I, I was always interested in the anatomy of creatures and learning, you know, what makes them different. And, you know, I had a, I had a aquarium that I, that was all dried out that I filled with geckos and I would feed them. And I had kind of a gecko farm as a kid. Uh, you, we also had fish. We also had, you know, our family dog, but I was really interested in these geckos and they seemed to all migrate um, in front of my house. So a lot of my upbringing, you know, I didn't have, you know, the fanciest toys or the nicest video games, even though I did have some of these Game Boy games uh, that I'm about to go over. Um, one thing that I kept myself busy with was being outside. And that's something that I feel like a lot of kids these days don't really get exposure to. It was different in the 90s. The 90s were an amazing time where you could still get time outside before kind of television and video games kind of took over the masses. And I think Satoshi was even more lucky considering the fact that he was developing this in the <clears throat> in the 80s, you know, when he's 17, uh, which I'll, I'll discuss that further on, but I just, the whole thing is amazing because I, it resonates greatly with me. And I think a lot of people, I think it's relatable to a lot of people is what I'm trying to say. I think a lot of us that are 90s, you know, I was born in 94, I got to experience, you know, being outside, playing, seeing, you know, animals and kind of running around and climbing trees and doing stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, I feel like a lot of kids are on their iPads, which is the sad reality of what's happening. But moving forward, um, the, uh, this was his favorite hobby, arguably. What inspired him to create Pokemon Red Game Boy games? So I did not know that originally the first Game Boy games were Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green. I had no idea about that. I thought what was dropped in North America was what was dropped everywhere else, but I was wrong. And so now I'm learning about the history and the timeline. So Red and Green were the originals. And to be honest with you, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that there was a green. I never even realized that Leaf Green was the retro of Red and Green. I did not realize that. I thought there was red, blue, and yellow. That's all I thought there was. I never knew that there was a green version. So this may be common knowledge to a lot of you guys. It's definitely not to me. It's new information to me, and I find it, you know, really awesome. Um, he was given the nickname, uh, blah, 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 blah. Satoshi recalls being distracted and bored while attending classes. I mean, obviously any of us can relate to that. Going to school, you're not sure if you're doing what you're passionate about or if, you know, you're just wasting your time or wasting potential. And, you know, to your parents, you know, my parents wanted me to do the best I could in school. Obviously, I think that's a lot of parents, what they want out of their kids. Uh, they have these high expectations, you know, to, to do better and get better grades and educate yourself and want to be educated, like actually want to be educated. Some of us aren't built for school. I struggled in school. So again, coming from an artist family, I think, you know, my parents can appreciate what I'm doing now more as a creative thing, you know, making videos, making content. I think they see it now more like what they were doing in the nineties, making artwork and kind of everybody kind of judging like they're, they're, they're going to make art for a living. Well, like I plan on making videos the rest of my life and maybe at some point making videos could be a living for me. Um, anyways, uh, kind of, I think a lot of people can relate to like going to school and just feeling like you're a little bit out of place. And even though I graduated and I got my degree, um, I think it would have been so easy for me without the family, without the support that I had and the role models that I had to even get through school. I just don't know if I would have done it. 
Um, as a teenager, Satoshi developed an insatiable urge to play video games. Um, again, highly relatable. Uh, my parents absolutely, I've just talked about them after reading all this stuff, like how interesting it was to me because of how monumental of a person that Satoshi is to the hobby and how he's really not mentioned a whole lot. I don't hear Satoshi's name mentioned a whole lot. I hear Arita mentioned all the time. Like... I, I pretty much always hear of Mitsuhiro Arita being mentioned. And, you know, I wonder, I understand you're, you're paying tribute to the artist, the, the, the drawer, but at the same time, um, you just don't hear about Satoshi a whole lot. And there were other games that he was involved in with Game Freak. So again, like, I think this video is great to put the shed light on the actual founders of Pokemon um, you know, Satoshi and, um, uh, Sugimori, Ken Sugimori. I don't know why I forget that. I saw their names so many times in playing the old, you know, Game Boy games, all the old games. Um, okay. Specifically all kinds of arcade games with large bases and the small screens. So, you know, there's big arcade games, which to me, it's something that I never really remember. So it's not really relatable to me. I know there might be some people here. Um, that are in their mid 30s, maybe 40s, and they can say, oh, I was around when the arcade games were a thing. And maybe you remember when arcade games were kind of falling off a little bit, because that's basically what Satoshi noticed. Him and Ken uh, Sugimori both noticed that it was falling off um, a little bit. Um, he loved it so much that he skipped his classes, which resulted in him flunking high school, which... If you've ever been to Japan, I haven't been to Japan, um, but I've had Japanese friends that have told me, you know, and I think it's culturally, this is a known thing um, that they're, that the Japanese are really strict on in terms of like the quality of effort, work, education. Um, I know I'm a big car fan. I know the car scene out there is insane. And I know that the builds they have out there are really epic and amazing. They have a big respect for the, they have a great respect for the things they do, including education. So I imagine, you know, you're in Japan, 1970, and you're flunking out of class and your parents are like, what are you doing? You're wasting your potential Satoshi. And he had to, he bottled that up and you know, he had to live with that. And still he persevered and persisted in chasing his dream. And I think that's, I think that's really important and people should take something from that point alone. Uh, no matter what kind of pressure's on you, if you want to do something and you're determined to do it and you're serious about it, just be consistent and trust the process and keep doing what you're doing. The same thing I'm doing with this channel. Um, he loved it so much, he skipped classes, which resulted in flunking high school, um, extremely frowned upon and brought shame upon his family. His parents could not understand his obsession with video games. Um, like most parents, worried that Satoshi was wasting his potential. Um, I, again, can relate with this heavily. Um, for me, it wasn't necessarily when, like, Call of Duty kind of changed the game scene. I think a lot of people were on Xbox Live when Call of Duty came out. You're playing with your high school friends. Modern Warfare 4 was the deal. Okay, but before that, it was really, for me, it was, it was Halo. And then before Halo, it was handhelds all the way. It was, you know, Pokemon... Fire Red, Leaf Green, Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, um, Pokemon Heart Gold, Soul Silver. You know, more recently, um, before I, you know, sold that stuff to fund other card purchases, which I really regret doing because Heart Gold and Soul Silver was a really amazing, masterful remake, and I really wish I would have kept that. And I had a Pikachu themed uh, DS, so I just, I, I really wish I would have kept that. But moving forward. Um, at age 17, uh, Satoshi created uh, the Game Freak magazine, which is when he became partners with Ken Sugimori. Um, so they were both kind of aspiring to change the gaming scene together, uh, with Sugimori more on the illustrative side from what I know. Um, and over time, Satoshi, Sugimori, and their employees, writers, realized that they no longer wanted to simply write about games, but wanted to build and create them. I can't imagine the kind of effort that went into that. And like, we'll, we'll get into this. We'll, we'll, we'll get into this. Um, 
It began back to Satoshi's childhood, adventures of exploring and catching bugs, and then coming up with the idea for Pokemon to catch them all, to catch all kinds of creatures, evolve them, and battle other creatures that have been guided by their human trainers. So I think this is a pretty big deal because it's it's someone who's taking their imagination, even as an adult, to the next level and saying, we're, we're going to adventure. This game's about adventure, catching monsters, and then fighting other monsters and fighting other humans with these monsters. I mean, at that time, this was a groundbreaking idea. And when you learn about this history, it's really obvious why Pokemon franchise has just taken off incredibly. Um, and while we're, a lot of us are coming back to the scene, you know, decades later, um, it doesn't change the fact that this game was always good and it always had buyers and always had a support. And I think all the games coming out now, those kids are going to be coming back to the hobby and going after the cards that came out now, everything in Sword and Shield. We've talked about this on the hobby, but I, I just think it's Pokemon is very cyclical and I'll get that. I'll say that again, probably at the end of this. Um, Okay, so um, it began, yeah, back in his childhood. Pokemon almost didn't happen. So here's an important part. Um, never quit your dreams because when you're really close, you could be, you could be right about to, you know, you've seen that meme where he struck the, the miner is striking the rock and they give up. But on the, on the, on the edge of that rock, on the other side is the diamonds um, that's pretty much the story of Satoshi and Pokemon, um, uh, going to Nintendo, them being skeptical, big business, corporate. I don't know if I want to take on this startup and basically just saying, you know, all of us are out except one guy and we'll get into that. Um, Pokemon almost didn't happen when the idea was first pitched to Nintendo in the early nineties. Um, Oh, sorry. Next one. I'm blanking out, guys. It's been a long day. Um, not only was Pokemon a big hit. Oh, wait. Wrong one. Unfortunately, at the time, Nintendo thought the project was too big. Thought the project was too big and too ambitious for the startup company. So, Ken and Satoshi, they had their game freak. And they had some stuff that they were working on. And they did, I believe so, they did have, an, I haven't done more research on this, but they did already have a track record making some games. They didn't have a big track record, but they had pulled some stuff off, I think, previously before pitching Pokemon. I might be wrong on that, but uh, I'm just going to keep going. Um, only one person liked the idea, which is another thing. You only need one person. My dad always said this whenever I started selling cards or doing anything in life. He was like, whatever you do in life, just remember you only need to reach a tiny, tiny smidgen of that market. You only need to capture a little bit of that market. And basically what happened was they went to this meeting, this like board meeting, whatever, with Nintendo, and they're talking about this game. And there's only one person in that meeting that's that's relatively interested in what Pokemon could become. And so that's, you know, going after that. You only need a tiny percentage of the market. You only need to convince one person. Um, and that's basically what happened. Um, they convinced um, Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, the creator of, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but, but the um, Miyamoto... Miyamoto, I think that's right. The creator of Donkey Kong. Um, obviously, Donkey Kong, if you had a Nintendo 64, I didn't, but I had friends that did. Donkey Kong was a huge hit. Huge hit. So you have the creator of Donkey Kong who's like, I don't know, I think these guys might have something. And it, I think the creator of Donkey Kong, he had a similar you know, imagination of vision. You know, These were creatures that you're battling with. It's very similar to what he did, but expanded on in a beautiful way. Um, with, um, with Miyamoto's guidance and Ken Sugimori working on character design, the Pokemon games growth, uh, Pokemon games, uh, grew from small, a small seed that would grow into a massive tree, uh, that is the Pokemon franchise with all of its branches. So weird analogy, but what I meant by this was Pokemon was just this small idea and it grew in this massive tree with all these branches. 
And each one of these branches, there's a different thing. You got plushies. Okay, you got, yes, I'm a grown man, I have plushies. You know, you've got toys. You know, you've got all kinds of things, and I guess plushies and toys could be in the same same area. You got, you know, the Game Boy games. I got my Game Boy Color um, up top, all the way up there. Um, you got a wide variety and range. Um, I brought this in here. I have it in our living room, but I brought it in here just to show you. You got all kinds of products. I don't know if you guys remember Master Trainer. I was obsessed with this game. I had a friend that had it. I did not have it. Um, I actually bought it last year, and we've only played it once, but it was so much fun to relive those memories. This is one of my favorite, like, old-school board games. I just absolutely love it. Um, I really want to get the other Master Trainers. Um, I imagine that... Um, sorry about Aspen. I imagine that I will, some people will see this and be like, oh my God, that's nostalgic. I need to get the master trainer. But moving on, um, lots of products that they came out with. Um, anyways, like I said, it's just, it grew into a massive tree with all these branches, with all these things. Pokemon is not just the trading card game or the video game, but it's um, more so just their incredible marketing and um, their media franchise as a whole. Um, cause yeah, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, over, over six years, um, yeah, game, game boy cards, uh, Pokemon go, which, um, Pokemon go, and we'll talk about that again, probably, but Pokemon go was insane, right? In 2016, 2017, people really got back into the hobby. Like I said, it's very cyclical. We go through these cycles where people go out, come in, go out. Um, and I think 2016 really solidified people coming in because it made it a social hobby. It was already a social hobby. It was a, the trading card game made it social, but you know, having Pokemon go really changed the scene with everybody getting outside, getting social, trying to train, you know, trying to collect Pokemon in a real life GPS, you know, satellite setting where, where you're actually walking, where the picture of where you actually are, the Pokemon pops up. I think that was pretty groundbreaking. So Pokemon Go is pretty incredible. And I might do another video on the history of like Pokemon Go and how that came to be, but that's for another time. Uh, toys, movies. I don't know if you guys remember, I went to the movies. Pokemon was a sick movie. Um, TV, obviously there's the anime show. Um, fast food, which it, it was just everywhere. It was absolutely everywhere. Everyone had the Pokemon bug in 99, 2000. You had Burger King, you had McDonald's. You didn't even care about getting that food. You wanted a Happy Meal so you could get those toys. And I'm sure one day those will be of high value. I know some of those things, like there are the gold cards and the Pokeballs. I know some of those things have actually gone up quite a bit in value. Um, but uh, over six years, Game Freak uh, had financial problems. So um, I guess, you know, you know, once they got things going with Nintendo, Game Freaks had some financial issues. You know, when you're running a business, investing in yourself, I'm sure this was the first massive endeavor they had like this. I know Satoshi must have been up to here in just debt, uh, stress, um, the lack of time management. I mean, I'm sure there was so much stuff going on at that point in time. Um, uh, Game Freak uh, had lost five employees and to ensure Pokemon's existence and give it a fighting chance, Satoshi gave up his salary. I'm just, I'm just writing kind of in my own words here uh, because that's how I see it. I mean, Satoshi loved this thing and poured his heart into this thing. And ultimately, Pokemon is a now endless, infinite legacy, you know, um, that perpetuates adventure and going into the unknown and, you know, learning about the natural world and... I don't know if that's going to end up happening. Um, I think kids are going to be more just sucked into the video games and the trading cards, but like that's what Satoshi was putting out there. He was putting out, you know, his childhood adventures. Um, and just the fact that he gave up his salary to make it work, like dude was ready to go broke for this cause. Satoshi was ready to like go bankrupt, lose it all for Pokemon. So if, someone creating it was willing to give up that much it, it's just it's reinforcement and more support as a collector that you are collecting something that has deep meaning and value uh from its origin um and that's pretty cool 
Um, and he also took up financial help from his father. Now, I, I didn't read too much into that. I know in my life I've taken help from my parents for schooling, um, you know, you know, making sure that I could actually afford to get a degree and go to classes, even though I'm not sure if I did it on my own, if I would have gone that route. But either way, right, we've all received help one form or another, probably from our family or distant family. Um, so I'm not really surprised that he had some financial help from his father, which at this time, you also have to understand he's got Game Freak. They've done a couple things. They've got the magazine. He's he's doing his own thing and he's doing it hard and he's thinking outside of the box and his dad maybe had caught on to it at this point. Um, how big this could go. He's like, dad, look at Donkey Kong. You know, they sold, you know, millions of copies in the US. What I have is better. And his dad was like, you know what? You're right. What you have is better. And I'm going to help you figure this out. Or maybe not better, but just different. Um, not only was Pokemon a big hit, but it was a cultural phenomenon. Still is today. Um, it's more pop culture-esque than it ever has been. Um, you can see so many great aspects easily. Um, easily to tell that it's extremely, it's been extremely successful. Um, yeah, I mean... We've got Crown Zenith just came out, sold out. I mean, that's not going to be the case with all sets, but they're all going to sell out eventually. Every product, most most every good product, like every, every decent product, the RCS boxes, the UPCs, anything that's like sitting, the gift boxes, those might sit for another year or two, but eventually they're going to completely clean out and they're going to become older and they're going to go up in value. And I, I just, they're just so successful. They're successful with executing selling out their retail product and they're successful executing. Um, and I don't even think this was part of the plan, but the secondary market just is crazy for this kind of stuff. Um, and it's never too late to get in. Somebody just messaged me on Facebook. I don't even know them, but they know I'm into Pokemon. So I'm going to go look at their collection on Monday and hopefully I'll have some great content to do. Every time one of these things happens, People want way too much. You know, everybody's aware of the value of Pokemon these days. So you, you don't get as many of those deals where it's like garage sale deal. I'm just trying to get rid of this stuff. But in this collection, there is a gold star Pokemon card. I'm not going to say which one it is, um, but I'm really excited. Um, but I'm also just, okay, Ryan, like, don't get too crazy here. Just don't get excited when you see the collection. Just, you know, give a fair, decent offer that would be basically market a little bit less than market without the fees and things anyways that's it that's i'm going off topic um uh, maybe a lesson to us all about being more present with nature and the environment so like that's the point that i just touched up on uh, because kids who roam forests and fields catching strange creatures might just be geniuses who create arguably the most successful media franchise ever so those are done and i've got some more um, points here. Um, okay, when it comes to Pokemon lately, um, you either see and subscribe to the trading cards, video games, anime, movies, or even plushies, or you just completely ignore it at all. You know, I have plenty of friends that just are like, yeah, it's not for me, not interested, or like, oh, that's the Pokemon cards. You, is the Pokemon, is Pokemon still a thing? Um, we get... We get that a lot. My dad is super, super guilty of this. He calls it Pokemon all the time. It bothers the heck out of me, but it is what it is. Um, first things first. So, Pokemon is short for Pocket Monsters. We already went over that. Game Freak started in the 1980s uh, in Japan with Satoshi uh, Tajiri. Ken Sugimori, along with, and these are other artists, which if I look over my bulk cards here from other sets like Neo Destiny, Neo Discovery, I actually can see these other artists. So that's why I'm mentioning these names. I don't want to just point out the, the main artist that everyone knows about, Mitsuhiro Arita. I want people to know about the other artists uh, just as well. Um, you know, Mitsuhiro Arita, Atsuko, Nishida, uh, Moto Fumi. Fu, Fujiwara, uh, Shigeki, Fuji, Fujiwara, Shigeki, uh, designed all 151 original Pokemon, uh, oh, Shigeki Marimoto, I'm sorry, I botched that up, 
uh, Motofumi Fujiwara and Shigeki Marimoto designed all 151 original um, original Pokemon, and uh, Atsuko Nishida was the original Pikachu designer. Atsuko Nishida, so original designer of the infamous Pikachu, which arguably becomes the mascot of Pokemon. He's kind of everywhere. Um, even though the illustrations still say, yeah, you've got the Ken Sugimori illustration. So the, um, the jungle Pikachu is Ken Sugimori illustrator. And the fat Pikachu is Mitsuhiro Arita. But I'm guessing the kind of developer was, um, I'm guessing the developer was Atsuko Nishida. Um, both Satoshi and Sugimori realized arcade games weren't cool anymore, and they developed games themselves. Shigeru uh, Miyamoto mentored uh, mentored Game Freak. So Shigeru, we, we just talked about him. He was the uh, Donkey Kong kind of creator, founder, um, and he mentored Game Freak uh, because not only did he like Pokemon, but he saw they had a previous track record, and they had done other stuff, and that their magazine was pretty cool. Um first games were pocket monsters red and green now again i did not know this stuff this is new information with me so go easy on me bear with me just because i'm a pokemon fanatic does not mean that i'm an expert um pocket monsters red and green a game combining collecting and trading and for anybody that's new to the channel hopefully they find this stuff helpful or if you don't know about the history of pokemon hopefully you find this helpful um the game combining collecting and trading monsters. Um, it sold 26, 20, it sold, um, well, it officially made its debut in 26th of February, 1996, 1996. So, so Japan definitely had to drop well before the U S obviously it's, it's origins are from Japan. Uh, but I didn't realize there was such a big gap, um, from, 19, was that 1996? 1996. So I was born in 1994. So Pokemon's inception really began two years after my birth. So I really didn't get the chance or the privilege to be a part of that, you know, hobby at its inception like a lot of people did. Um, in some ways, I almost feel bad for anybody that was a part of that generation and didn't hold on to that stuff. That would be detrimental to me i really didn't have any valuable first gen like og stuff so i don't feel like i missed out that much i didn't even have that many cards as a kid i have a way cooler collection than i ever had as a kid Yu-Gi-Oh, different story i was into Yu-Gi-Oh big but we're talking about pokemon and the history of pokemon um um marks the debut of the franchise in the form of both games in the Game Boy in Japan. Red and Green were both very basic Japanese role-playing games. Um, you play as a trainer traveling the world, collecting a hodgepodge of, you know, Pokemon, you know, a bunch of just random Pokemon that are kind of, um, you know, in different areas. You know, some are rock Pokemon in caves or like bats, you know, Zubat, you'd find that in a cave. You know, some water Pokemon, Magikarp, hate running into a bunch of Magikarps, but at the same time, cool, turns into Gyarados. Um, you find those in the water if you had Surf, if you had the move Surf, and you could, you know, Surf out onto the water. You know, in the grass, you'd find like Nidoran or Weedle. So like the Pokemon were kind of in their designated areas, kind of like in the natural world. Um, so pretty cool. Um, and all this inspired by Satoshi's childhood, which would then be which these Pokemon would then be trained and evolved to battle their trainers um, and other wild Pokemon. Um, you'd start with a single Pokemon, the starter, dubbed starter. Um, again, uh, the Pokemon that you'd, in the original games that you would end up starting with, I'm, I'm really glad I just had these laying out, like ready to grab. Um, we've got, uh, I'll zoom in here for anybody new to the channel. Um, we've got um, the Bulbasaur, you know, the grass type, Squirtle, and I kind of liked all of these. We got Charmander. Um, those were the starters that you would traditionally pick um, out of these games. Um, I'll go ahead and put these back, all stacked up so nicely. Um, 
let's see. So you'd start with single Pokemon and collect them all, so to speak. However, to get all 151, you needed both games. So I was completely unaware of this. I honestly never even really knew why they were different games. I thought they just liked the idea of people thinking they had to have both games. And maybe they just had a slight differentiator. Like in Gold and Silver, you'd have a Ho-Oh or a Lugia. In Fire Red, Leaf Green, you might have a slightly different kind of legendary Pokemon or a Shining Pokemon that's hard to catch in a different in a certain area. Uh, but for the most part, I remember the layouts for the games being very similar. So I don't know how different they were other than maybe you just had to get certain Pokemon that were exclusive to each game. Um, I never really thought about that. So I think it's really strategic and cool that they had this idea of having, you know, each game and you could only get Pokemon exclusive to that game. Um, so you had to trade and you had to be social with other kids. So even if you were a shy kid and you were playing your video games all day, that taught you to get out of your shell and talk to the other kid. Literally, you could be the nerdiest nerd and you're talking to, you know, the, the jock of the school who is also, well, not, not, let's just say we're, we're, we're young here, you know, um, and you've got, you know, the kid who's really into sports, but has the game also and has a Pokemon that you want and you both want something from each other, you know, there's a way to socialize, trade, um, and also battle. Um, and I remember I had that kind of the connector link. I had that for my Game Boy Advance, but I don't think I had it for the Game Boy Color. Um, so to speak, however, you had to, to get all 151, you needed to trade with other players uh, as red and green had exclu Pokemon exclusive to the games. If you had a Game Boy Link, you could trade as well as battle each other. Um, you would travel to different gyms and win badges and become a master and defeat uh, the evil set of characters as well. So um, I know Sapphire and Ruby was a game that I probably remember most vividly because I played it so much in Emerald. Uh, you had Team Aqua and Team Magma. That was kind of the rehash. And they, they, they do a great job of rehashing. Pokemon does a great job of rehashing the same stuff that's been used over and over. You know, it's kind of like the Jordan retros. I'm a big sneakerhead, so they do it in the sneaker world. They retro really incredible shoes over and over and over again because they really those mainline shoes really appeal to the masses um and they basically did that with pokemon uh as well um and you know in the original games it was team rocket right you know jesse james got our team rocket returns booster box down here we've got our team rocket booster boxes in the corner over here but it was jesse and james and team rocket and you know giovanni who they're you know they're Giovanni has his Persian, and they're on the gym. They're in the gym challenge set as far as the training trading cards go. Uh, but Giovanni, Giovanni was the boss. He was the evil guy in Team Rocket. Arguably, Giovanni was just just dope. Like I don't see him as the bad guy. I just think Giovanni was sick. He was trying to get all the Pokemon. He was trying to have the strongest Pokemon. But at the same time, he was the evil guy. He was the Pokemon like dealer, so to speak. You know he. You know, they, they had these Pokemon to do harm to other people. Um, and they're always, you know, they always, Jesse and James always had schemes. And then it would be Team Rocket blast off again or something like that. Um, and Ash would always defeat them. Um, and Ash was your main, your main character in the anime. But uh, moving on, uh, the trading collecting mentality made the game hobby social. And Go is another extension of that. So, uh, like I said before, uh, the game, the hobby was extremely sociable. So it got kids out, it got them playing the game, but it also got them to hang out with each other and hang out with their friends. Uh, they could trade Pokemon and battle each other, which, man, if I could go back and have that link. And the great thing is, there's still this product out there, but it is insanely expensive, guys. If you look at the most recent listings for brand new Game Boy games, red, blue, yellow, they're very expensive, guys. These games are not going down in price, in my opinion. They're only gonna get more expensive. And honestly, that's a route that I want to get into soon. You know, it's a really important extension of Pokemon, arguably almost more important than the cards. And that pains me to say, because I love Pokemon cards, but honestly, I don't think anything beats having the vintage games. I'd like sets out that I can play, and I'd like sets that I can store that'll be sealed and or, and or graded. Um, 
I've heard horror stories about people getting their Game Boy games graded. We'll get into that. But I think as a collector, that's definitely a route, a route that I want to go down at some point. It would be amazing to train teams in those old games and then get to pitch them against each other and play, you know, even today against a friend or family. Like if I got my wife to have a team and we just played together, it would just be so much fun for me. Um, uh, let's see. And Go is a great example. Pokemon Go, people getting out, people being social again, people doing raids, people doing Pokemon Go Facebook groups and meeting up and going to random areas and training. During 2016, 2017, you just saw people walking around everywhere because of Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go did something for the world that we have not had ever, ever. And it was a game that got people outside, running around, walking around, looking like robots, just moving in random directions, trying to fall in their phone. There was, you know, there was stuff on the news talking about people getting in car wrecks, people playing Pokemon Go while they're driving, you know, while they're walking, they're not looking anywhere. So it was really, it was a wild time and it got people really thinking about Pokemon. It had a slight effect on me, but it didn't affect me enough. I was finishing school. I was going to school for business and finance and I wanted to dig get a degree, which is what I did, uh, but I'm so glad to be back in this hobby and collecting and kind of rehashing my childhood. Um, important mainline releases like red, green, blue, and yellow um, uh, came out. Yellow features a Pikachu that follows you. So this was the kind of counterfeit uh, yellow that we had here. I think it's like Chinese. Uh, but Pikachu would follow you similarly to the anime where if you watch the anime over again, I've recently watched uh, Indigo. I watched it last year. I'm re-watching re it again. Um, Ash gets his Pikachu and he's like, he's like, just give me anything. And he gets the Pikachu and Pikachu won't get in his uh, Pokeball. Pikachu refuses to get in his Pokeball. He just stays around. He follows you everywhere. And in the uh, in the Game Boy game, he's just kind of behind you the whole time. It's it's actually awesome. And Heart Gold Soul Silver did that again. I do believe they did that again. I'm pretty sure when I was playing Heart Gold Soul Silver, um, I did see um, Pikachu running around with me. God, I wish I didn't sell that game. I wish I did not sell that game. Even though it was a remake, it was still so good. Um, and the Pikachu theme DS. Uh, Okay, um, oh, we've got our last one. Pikachu followed you, similarly to the anime, uh, where he did not stay in his Pokeball. Pokemon Yellow led to Pikachu being the most popular loved Pokemon uh, ever. Um, Pocket Monster's success led to North America getting, getting uh, games in 1998, and soon after, the cards followed. I do remember, I was extremely young, but I do remember a year or two after Pokemon had been out. I was maybe five, six, maybe seven. I do remember my mom bringing something home. And it was like, it was like a Pokemon VHS. You know, she knew I loved watching animes. They would come home Friday nights and they would bring home Yu-Gi-Oh. I was really big into Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, I feel like I just missed the vintage Pokemon boat. I just missed it. And it just wasn't something on my radar. Whereas Yu-Gi-Oh! was something I was playing with my friends at recess and on the playground. So I was really, really into it. Um, but she brought me that home, that stuff home all the time. And I was watching this VHS and it was talking about the 1999 New York uh, tournaments. And it was crazy. You had these, you had big groups, crowds of people in New York at this, you know, national tournament playing. You had kids with their parents, you know, as their like mascots. And there are all these kids that are just like, walking around like being Pokemon trainers, eight, nine years old, you know, trying to play these tournaments and, you know, that's, and they're, you know, learning how to add, subtract. There's a lot of other good things about Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, just trading card games in general, teaching you to socialize, teaching you to strategize, teaching you to read. And I think that's why my mom was okay with it and bought me Yu-Gi-Oh! trading cards because she understood that I would read these things. You know, that was one way to get me to read. I did not like reading anything. Um, in 1998 and soon after the cards followed as Pokemon became a worldwide obsession. Um, Japan got gold and silver in 1999 and US got it in 2000 
featuring a new generation of Pokemon. So then you had, you know, your Neo Genesis came out and you had your Gen 2 Pokemon coming out. Uh, again, 99, 2000 was just too early for me. I was born in 94, so I was five, six years old. I was really still just too young, I feel like, to get totally immersed into it. And about a year or two later, you know, I was catching on to Pokemon. I was wanting more Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So uh, I remember it hitting. I just, I just don't remember it as vividly as I think most people that were born slightly before me. Um, in Gold and Silver, you could breed Pokemon and had a real day and night system. Um, this set of games outsold Yellow with 1.4 million copies sold in a week, marking the fastest uh, sold game ever, along with Stadium, which took over as the best-selling home console game. So we're talking about, when I say Stadium, we're talking about Pokemon Stadium. So I have it back here. And I have the other one as well over here. Uh, it's this gold game over here. Um, but I'm just going to put it up and zoom in just so you guys can see a little bit of the history. Um, you had Pokemon Stadium. And this was being played on... Uh, I'm going to regret this, but let's go ahead and move, get all this stuff up. This was played on the Nintendo 64. So you had your Nintendo 64. You had your Game Boy game like so. You just... Popped. Oh, wait. I missed one step. If you know, you know. You popped it in there, and then you were good to go. So that was, you know, when Stadium came out, it was a huge deal for Pokemon uh, in, in general. Let me go ahead and set this back down here. And uh, just to give you guys some reference, these were the controllers that they had for the Nintendo 64. Really just nostalgic, really just brings back all the memories. Um, absolutely love that stuff. And I wasn't even into Pokemon when I bought that stuff. I just knew that Stadium and what was that? Pokemon Coliseum? Oh no, Stadium 2. Um, so, and Stadium 2 is gold, kind of like uh, gold and silver featuring the Ho-Oh and the Lugia. Um, Doot, 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 doot. Fastest sold ever along with Stadium, which took over as the best-selling home console game sold for Nintendo 64. Pokemon grew to 2010 with gold um, with gold and silver selling 23 million units. So I played Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I thought that I thought that was the was kind of like just the reanimation of the old games. And it was, but I literally didn't even know that there was a gold and a silver. Um, that was released in, uh, oh no, 2010 was Heart Gold Soul Silver. Yeah, yeah, 2010 was Heart Gold Soul Silver. Uh, pardon me. Um, selling 23 million units. So in 2010, 23 million units sold still. That's nuts. That's nuts in the scale of like video game sales. Like the only other ones I can think of are Call of Duty and Halo. Halo was huge for me. Again, that's why I have my. Uh, Halo helmet in the back here. I really kind of want to keep it on the channel. I know I'm running out of space on my shelving, um, but uh, you know, I th you know, when I think of video games, that's what I think about: Call of Duty, Halo, and then boom, um, Nintendo 64, Super Smash Bros. And so I think Mario, Mario may be the number one um, game franchise, but in terms of media franchise and, and products total. Uh, I'm pretty sure Pokemon is number one in the world, like, ever. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So, now we're getting into kind of what I grew up with. Sapphire and Ruby took over with the Game Boy Advance, introducing double battles. Y'all remember that? When you had two Pokemon playing against two other Pokemon as a team? That was sick. Um, introducing double battles, ranking it best Game Boy Advance game in sales ever since the past decade and a half pokemon has made remakes with slightly different names we kind of went over that for the old game feel with the updated visuals um as soon as game boy nintendo and game freak realized remakes sell really well uh, a long line of retro versions released such as fire red leaf green games that i definitely grew up with um 
The same narrative of successful sales continued all the way to today in 2023, where Pokemon continues to thrive and dominate the gaming world. Um, anime has almost a thousand episodes, um, or more at this point. This could have been old information. Uh, anime follows Ash, Ke Ash Ketchum. Now, in the original, in the original. Uh, Japanese anime or game. I'm not sure which one it was. I didn't write this down, but I read it. They use Satoshi's name instead of Ash Ketchum. That might have been in Pocket Monsters, the original like trading card Pokemon game that wasn't necessarily like I'm not entirely sure, but um, I know Satoshi was initially used and that kind of became Ash, you know, and then they just let you put your name in for the Game Boy games. Um, anime follows Ash Ketchum in his adventures featuring TV and movies, including live action Detective Pikachu. So if Detective Pikachu definitely resonated some nostalgic feelings for me. Fantastic movie. Love Ryan Reynolds. He just did fantastic as that voiceover. And that movie was sick. Pokemon into live action is absolutely incredible. I don't care what ratings that movie was given. Absolutely incredible. Um, and then here I just have starred pop culture phenomenon uh, tends to resurface in a cyclical manner. So Pokemon does this thing where they come out with something, a product comes out, people get really into it. Right now, as an investor in Pokemon, it's like it's endless um, opportunity because You've now got people like myself, you've got YouTubers, you've got streamers. Um, the, the hobby is just heating up so much. It's just, it seems exponential. You know, Crown Zenith was the latest set that just came out um, here in 2023 to start the year. And it just, January 20th, sold out online. All the ETBs sold out. Anyways, the history of Pokemon has really been an incredible thing to follow and be a part of. And I think... It's extremely important as a collector to be knowledgeable about that history, about the thing that you're collecting most, um, more so than just the product. Um, and, you know, I think we need to talk about the history of Mitsuhiro Arita. I don't feel like I hear much about him or read much about him. I, and I'd love to have cards signed by him, but I kind of want to know his story and his background other than just uh, the you know, the actual drawer, the illustrator of a lot of these cards. I mean, um, you know, Arita has done such a fantastic job with uh, the original, all the original Pokemon. Um, I used to think, see, I'm still learning here. I, I used to think that uh, illustrated by KG uh, Kenibuchi. So there's, there's plenty of illustrators that I probably didn't even mention that I wish I could have mentioned that were in the original um, original sets. I guess we were talking about base set only, um, but definitely not just Arita. There's a lot of interesting names of people that have you know been the creators, the drawers of this stuff that need you know to be paid tribute. You know, um, and I hope that history doesn't get lost in translation over time as people are hyping up products and talking about what to buy and where to buy it. Um, I think we should always remember the history of Pokemon and hopefully this video finds its way to the right people uh, who can appreciate it and appreciate this knowledge being passed down from generation to generation. Um, and uh, I just think the whole story is absolutely incredible. Um, and Ken Sugimori, I'd like to know more about Ken Sugimori as well. Um, but um, Satoshi's Satoshi's whole story about being a kid, not being interested in school, um, Nintendo being skeptical, the whole thing is a dream. It really is. Like running around in the fields of Tokyo and going in the forest and, and, and wooded areas and collecting bugs and things. You have a very interesting person here that started something that should embody that still. And I feel like 
as much as I haven't been present in the hobby long enough, and it feels like I don't deserve to say this, you know, Pokemon has come such a far way, and I, I just hope that they can they can bring back some of these, you know, feelings of adventure and, you know, going out and, you know, catching creatures. And I think Pokemon Go did such a fantastic modern version of that. Um, but it's like crazy because there's so much to the history of Pokemon. There's so much in terms of products that have released over the past, you know, couple decades. And it's really only to the U.S. 24 years old. So... It has a long way to go. There's been so much, so much passion and history that goes into and love that goes into the last 24 years. I'm looking forward to the next 24. I just, I hope, you know, I hope, um, I hope the illustrators now are really looking hard at these older artworks and illustrations and they're advancing, but I think it's good to take a step back and look at the history of it and look at where these artworks have come from, you know, their origins and maybe pay tribute to that. Maybe do some alternate art cards that kind of have a similar um, vintage look to them. I Some people think vintage is dead. I don't think vintage will ever die because vintage is the foundation, the fundamental necessity to the history of Pokemon and feeling like you're a part of that is really important for me personally to feel close to that history and close to the antiquity sides of it. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the history of Pokemon and Satoshi just being an incredible creator and an incredible artist. And um, whatever you guys are doing in life, um, if you're passionate about it, just don't stop. Don't stop. Be consistent, um, be determined, be disciplined, and it might come to the point of feeling like you have to give up everything you have to make something work. That's essentially what Satoshi did when Game Freak went bankrupt. So I think that's an important takeaway to see here in the grand scheme. But otherwise, I hope it was as factual as possible. And um, you guys have a fantastic night. I can't wait to upload this. Enjoy. Oh, one more thing. We've got mail. I'll be doing a mail day soon. I want to do other informative videos as well. I want to do a live stream hangout with you guys. I'm just trying to figure out my work schedule. Um, and um, thank you guys who've been supportive to me through my whole YouTube career process. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much.